Hey, Red Clay Rambler fans, we just passed the ninth birthday of the show. So to help celebrate that, I'm asking you to contribute $9 to support our new season. You can get involved by making a donation through the PayPal portal at talesofredclayrambler.com slash donate, or you can make a monthly pledge at patreon.com slash redclayrambler. If you join Patreon today, you can access perks like t-shirts, water bottles, and other podcast swag, as well as having access to the Patreon-exclusive Tales from the Vault podcast, which features remastered episodes that are no longer available on major podcast apps. Thanks for listening and being a part of this Red Clay Rambler community. With your support, I can keep the show rolling into its new 10th season. So thanks again, and let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 378 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today is the final installment of Canada Week. That is a series of five interviews leading up to the Ceramic Congress, which is hosted by Canada. This is a five-day online conference that's running from May the 27th through the 31st, and the attendance fee for that conference is only $10. So you can find out more about that by visiting the Ceramic School website and search for the Ceramics Congress. For today's interview, I talked to Brendan Tang about his mixed media sculpture. You guys are probably familiar with his Manga Ormolu series, which mixes Ming Dynasty forms with mechanical technopop elements. In this interview, we talk about that body of work, as well as his recent show, Reluctant Offerings, which features sculptures made from Joss paper. If you guys would like to see that exhibition, it's going to be up at the Nanaimo Gallery from May the 21st to July the 11th. You can find that at nanaimoartgallery.ca. If you'd like to see other examples of Brendan's work, you can go to his website. That's brendantang.com. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's start talking about the show you did. This was probably two years ago or maybe three years ago called Ready Player Two. Can you talk about the work that was in the show and the direction that that went? Yeah. So Ready Player Two was a show that I did at the Reach Gallery out in Abbotsford, British Columbia. And I was invited by, well, I was invited by Sonny Asu, who was my co-collaborator on that show. And he is an artist that's based here on the West Coast of Canada. He lives up on the Clockwakiwak First Nations up in Campbell River on the island. And he's, well, he also grew up and lived in Vancouver. But he was invited by Laura Schneider, uh, the curator at the time. Uh, to do a show and Sonny and I had been working together collaborating on some side projects and this he saw as an opportunity to for both of us to really push forward and, and make a show the show kind of really stemmed out of kind of a bit of a love letter to our childhood our our very similar childhood uh back in the 80s and kind of mining that history and what happened to both of us um 
and seeing how that has informed the work that we make as adults now, as artists. And what was interesting is, the, you know, kind of looking back at it now, we were both really nerdy kids. He was super into comic books and into video games. I was into like fantasy and D&D and comic books as well. And, <clears throat> and you know, kind of still am. Both of us are still into those things. And I think I think it was kind of at the, you know, back in the eighties, this, that was an outsider activity. It wasn't sort of, you know, we didn't have like a Marvel movie every summer that, you know, thousands hundreds of thousands of people went to. So it was, it was kind of a unique thing at the time. And so it was interesting kind of doing that work. And there was like so many works that came out of it, but it felt like that show really had uh, an echoing effect in terms of what I do, because it was really an opportunity to work uh, well, not only collaboratively, but in a different way than I do with ceramics. The show itself was composed of three different elements. Uh, there was, um, we did an installation of a domestic space. So we had like a small little vignette of uh, sort of the kitchen table set up with D&D &D and, and also our own artwork on it. And then we had the quintessential 80s basement with the fake wood paneling and the whole thing. Uh, and we had like uh, Hawkins cheesies uh, and all different sorts of things. Uh, I made actually a bowl of porcelain Hawkins cheesies. And then uh, Sunny contributed a maple turned uh, copper lined bowl, uh, which are very auspicious materials to his community and uh, sort of paired them together and presented that. Um, and then the second element was an arcade kind of quote unquote, an arcade. And then the final one was uh, the comic book store. And these are all sort of within air quotes. And so those two spaces we played a lot with, you know, these were places where we, as children sort of found our own agency because we were out of the purview of our parents. The, this was back in the day where helicopter parenting wasn't a thing. It was just like <laughs> latchkey kids. It's like, get out of the house. And, and so you kind of get to form yourself uh, in those spaces. Uh, and also, it was also an interesting time to kind of also reflect on the sort of the the art gallery and its similarities to the comic book store, not only in terms of its uh similarities in terms of its role in commerce and capitalism, but also its role in terms of like ideas around collecting objects. I find collectors of comic books and baseball cards and that sort of thing are not dissimilar to art collectors. And so there were some really fun things there. And those were opportunities for show our own practice. Sunny has a uh, very uh, intense sort of painting practice and I had my ceramic works there. And so it was a, a really fun thing. Um, and then also, so there was the installation aspect of it, but there was also, I started doing these just paper works, these paper objects where I was making replicas of, uh, my first Nintendo, the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES, and then also a Game Boy. And then uh, our first VCR that we had that had wood paneling on it and everything. And at that stage, I was originally thinking about them as sort of as fetish items and thinking about what does it mean for an artist to make a replica of something, to do a still life of something? I feel like that is a very specific gesture uh, in the same way that, you know, like if somebody does a portrait of you, it is in a way like honoring you or in the Andy Warhol way, it's making you immortal in a lot of ways. And it's like thinking about that gesture towards inanimate objects and what does that mean? And, but then as the work has evolved, I also started becoming more self-reflexive into my own ethnic history and relationship to paper objects and that sort of thing. Well, yeah, let's geek out on the eighties for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You, the, that wood paneling in that installation took me right back to my basement as a kid playing the first Nintendo and we got a game cheater, a game genie to try to beat all of the games and you had to put in all these codes and then it gave you like infinite lives. It was, it was a, as a kid, it was a celebratory moment. But what's interesting is when I saw your installation and I, and I've seen installations that have a similar um, nostalgic feel, it always makes me feel happy and sad, which I think nostalgia kind of walks that fine line while you're looking back and going, ah, oh, I kind of miss that. But also, you know, life was, 
simpler and more complicated back then. So can you can you talk about looking back at your own life to draw from specifically like with gaming and those things in terms of the emotional quality that they have for you as a human being? You know, that show was a real, and I didn't really get it. Like, you know, when you're making work for yourself, you always think it like really personal and no one's going to get it. And then you show it. And definitely with the Ready Player Two show, it was a real trigger for Gen Xers. And that's the generation that I belong to. And, you know, it was in a lot of ways that was really great because it's in, I feel like it is a generation that doesn't get seen very much, uh, kind of living in the shadow of the boomers and now living in the up shadow of millennials (laughs) and, and, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, like, I think that was one of the things that was interesting about that show, especially when Sonny and I started making it, there was this question about using the, the, those influences of video games and comic books and that sort of thing. And there is such a large community of fan art that's being made in and around Mario and Zelda and, you know, Wolverine and all of that sort of stuff. And we didn't necessarily want to sort of tap into that or add to that conversation. We wanted to kind of look at it more critically and kind of interrogate uh, the messages that we were given and where that sort of stems into. There were elements that were celebratory, but there, I think there were also, there's like a a reel of uh, curated advertisements that I had found online. And it's like, thank God for making art with YouTube being accessible. And I used a lot of those ads and like all the microaggressions that exist within those ads towards people of color and uh, gender stereotypes and uh, gender roles. Uh, It was really kind of in a lot of ways, you kind of feel sad for your younger self and like all of these messages that we were inundated with. And you're just like, man, how do you like how you still, you know, that's amazing that you were still able to lift your head high and kind of move beyond that sort of stuff. And, and I think it's, it's a pretty interesting um, kind of thing to look back. Yeah. Nostalgia is a very strong element of that work. And even within works that I've doing now. So yeah, it's like the Joe's paper, the installation, the use of nostalgia. And I think nostalgia is such a powerful tool and we've seen it used um, so much within advertising, but also like in the political realm, like where things are happening and people are being manipulated and sold a bill of goods that is not, you know, they're the promise of easier times. And it's just like so messy and complicated. (laughs) And I think nostalgia is an isolating impulse, meaning that like you attach to the one thing you love about an era and you ignore everything else. And I, I see that with my with my fam- my family in Virginia are very conservative. And I see as they've been in my mind radicalized by the Trump uh, effort, mm-hmm. I, I see them picking the parts of the 50s and 40s they love and totally overlooking racism. I mean, people <laughs> were being killed in around where I live for their race up until the 50s. Mm -hmm. It is an ugly history, but I see I see my family like latch on to one specific thing that they loved as if that was a good era. And it's it's honestly confusing. (laughs) Yeah, and it was really funny, like kind of going in even into the history or the etymology of nostalgia. And it's I think it's a Greek word that basically translates to home pain. And it was a diagnosis given to soldiers by a medical doctor saying that you have nostalgia. And it was seen as a like a disease or a mental illness that needed to be treated. And like the only way of treating it was like listening to music from back home or going back home or visiting those sorts of things. And easing one's anxiety and mental state. And so, but now we see it as a positive thing, which is really interesting. And I think, um, yeah, it's, yeah, I think that that's the funny thing about nostalgia is that it is so much about blinders and just sort of seeing the happy parts. And, you know, I think that's an interesting thing about the human brain, like thinking about forgetting the turmoil and kind of putting a positive spin on it, because I think it's really easy. And man, I suffer from it intensely. It's like to just get into a nihilistic state, like, especially with the state of the world, even beyond politics, like just (laughs) the physical state of the world. It's just like, it's easy just to remember, like, or just focus in on the the crappy parts. Can you explain to people what Joss paper is for those that aren't familiar with that tradition? 
Yeah, absolutely. So joss paper is a Chinese Buddhist tradition um, where you burn uh, paper objects or they originally started as a uh, like a very specialized piece of paper. I can't remember if it's rice or bamboo, but uh, it would have like gold leaf on it and you would burn it. And the idea is that <clears throat> this object then goes to your ancestors in the afterlife and they could use it to buy things because the afterlife is very similar to this world where there's commerce and exchange. And so you wanted to give them to arrive not empty handed. And so originally it sort of started with like these sort of types of replicas of money. And even if you go into any sort of Chinatown, you can probably find hell money as one of those things and people burn that. Uh, but flash forward to now, they they make paper replicas of any technology. So the new iPad or a Samsung phone or a Gucci bag or a Rolex watch. And these are burnable items. And in fact, I have <laughs> one of my favorite just paper objects that I have an authentic one is a pack of Marlboro cigarettes. And it's like, it's, it's like a paper pack and then it's got paper cigarettes and there's a paper lighter for, for Nana who just can't give up smoking on the afterlife. <laughs> so I, you know, those are some, those are some really beautiful kinds of things that I was really excited about. And I kind of come to it as an outsider too, like kind of looking at these objects and just being like, what is this about? And then really falling in love with this idea of it as a device of communicating with one's ancestors. Um, when I hung the show, the most recent show that I did, I had some just paper objects and I was talking to my dad about it. And he had mentioned, he's like, oh, I remember those burning objects. My mother, my grandmother, uh, used to burn these paper things and I never knew what it was. And this is the first time he had mentioned this to me. And I was just like, what? Really? That's crazy. That's, you know, kind of amazing. I have very specific memories of being in Shanghai and going to the Jing'an Temple, which is this very public temple that's like right in one of the main thoroughfares in Shanghai. And people brought in, when I was there, There was there's a altar that's outside and then you kind of go up into the temple to the inside space. But they were burning a replica of a house in the outside space. So it was very public, which if as an observer, it felt like I was too intimate, you know, like I was watching someone's religious practice, but then they were also in the middle of this bustling city. Like the way that that temple is set up, if you're, if you live in one of the buildings around, you just look down into the temple. Like that's mm -hmm. the, that's the way it goes. So this idea though, of you would burn an object to then send it to the afterlife to me seems like a really rich space for an artist because it's about communicating with what's not seen. Yeah. You know, so can you talk a little bit more about in Ready Player Two, like some of the objects you made weren't burnt, but you implied that they were going to be burnt by putting a porcelain match in with them. So can you talk more about that burning aspect as communication? Yeah, so that was so the with the Ready Player Two, it was kind of they we had the objects kind of out on coffee tables and in in the video sort of cabinet. And then I when I started doing, I continued doing those bodies or doing those objects and thinking about what they represent. And I had them with a porcelain match. So there was an invitation uh, to burn this object. And, and that was a way of sort of gently guiding um, the audience in terms of how to unpack the work or how to view the work as well. Um, but at the same time, like a lot of my work, it, it, they, it tends to be really slippery and really nuanced. And so there's another aspect to the work that I had been thinking about in terms of this idea of burning. And I'd been introduced to this uh, therapeutic practice where if you have, and you may have heard of it, but if you have like a trauma or something that is weighing heavily on you, you write it out on a piece of paper and then you burn that piece of paper as a way of releasing that tension or that anxiety or as a way of like catharsis. And I was really interested in those ideas. And so I was specifically making objects from my childhood, um, the Atari ET cartridge. I had Mike Tyson's punch out and um, 
and a, a game, another Game Boy and that sort of thing. And they were really quite fun, nostalgic things. And I was thinking more about uh, me being a middle-aged man and being really interested in this history, this gaming history and things from my childhood. And also being mindful of those, you know, the moniker, the sort of man child. And like, you know, as an adult, you're supposed to let these things go and, and with having a porcelain match there, I am saying, oh, I can release this. I can let it go. But I'm presenting a porcelain match. It's it's not an actual functioning match. It's it's So it's more like saber rattling. It's kind of like that thing of like, oh, yeah, I'll let that go. But no, I won't. What was interesting about that work is that it became even more personal. So I did a rendering of a VHS copy, uh, a video cassette copy of a movie called They Call Me Bruce, which is this old comedic movie um, from the 80s. I believe it was the late 80s. And it uh, sort of featured a Korean uh, comedic actor who was um, in America on sort of in LA or something like that. And he was... Was, uh, had discovered that people would was were mistaking him for Bruce Lee. And he would like trip in a, like walking down the street and people would be like, whoa, 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 don't beat me up, man. And they would be like, then he was just like, people just think like quick movements that I do is like, I'm going to do martial arts or something. And so as children and as a, we thought it was hilarious because it was one of the first kind of representations of Asian male in popular culture and he was a comedian and it was quite hilarious and it was empowering, but also really ridiculous. You know, if you were to watch that movie now, it is incredibly problematic. There's lots of stereotypes being played out and it's just all this sort of thing. But it's, you know, I was presenting an object that has this dual meaning. It's just like, it is both something that I identified with as a child and also saw as a way of navigating being a, a brown kid who's Asian in a white community is using humor to navigate um, my existence and also to sort of deflect and, and as a survival tactic. And so, but then at the same breath, kind of also seeing it as an adult and just being like, there's a lot of problematic messages that are being, little Brendan is taking on there. And so in a way, you know, like thinking about how these things happen in our lives and sometimes not wanting to let go of the bad things because you feel like it, it defines who you are. And also, but also acknowledging that it's problematic to hold on to these hurt feelings and these things that can be corrosive to your personality. And so it, it plays with that sort of duality there. It also is, you know, a gift uh, kind of talking to my ancestors, you know, kind of harkening back to that just paper thing and kind of moving into the new body of work called Reluctant Offerings is kind of like the almost not the like the final iteration, but kind of close to where closure with these this idea is, is kind of circling back to the original idea of communicating with my ancestors. So my family, um, there's been a lot of uh, immigration going on in my family. M my father is first generation Trinidadian, so he's from Trinidad. And my mom is third or fourth generation Trinidadian. And my father's family is originally from China and my mom's family is originally from India. When they were together, they moved to Dublin, Ireland, and that's where I was born. And then we immigrated to Canada. So there's lots of jumping around and lots of sort of disconnect with my family history. And there's also disconnect within my father and his fam his parents, because when they left China, it was probably for political reasons and probably not for great reasons. And and there was a really great severing of the communication about who they left behind in China and my parents, my father's relationship with that family back home, back in China. And so with the just paper and the reluctant offerings, I'm burning these objects, but they're objects that I'm not sure that they would get. Uh, like, you know what I mean? It's like getting, you know, a candy bar from a foreign country. You're just like, wow, this looks like a candy bar, but I'm not <laughs> sure how it's going to taste. And so it was like, I was kind of sending these objects. And so they become reluctant in the sense that I am almost kind of exploring that idea of that embarrassment in and around communicating with a lost history and a lost connect to family.
Yeah, and with reluctant offerings, we, we should actually describe the Joss paper process before we go farther. You're watercoloring in detail images like with Ready Player Two, you know, the uh, the ET cassette, like it is rendered in a way in which it is immediately obvious what it is. But with reluctant offerings, you've taken that craftsmanship and upscaled it to make a full full size F one fifty truck that is yeah. in the gallery. So you're offering the object through the ancestors, but you're also offering craftsmanship, you know, to watercolor an F-150 full-size truck. Like that is a dedication to labor and craftsmanship that is, that's immense. <laughs> so can you talk about how that particular piece came about? Yeah. So I think, <laughs> thank you for acknowledging that. I just like, it's always like, it's a really, when you say it out loud, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it was, <laughs> it's a lot of, it was pretty interesting to make. So with that project, um, I was invited by the Nanaimo Art Gallery to do uh, a project and they, they are doing a thing where for a year, they invite um, artists uh to answer a, a general question. And this year's general question was, what is progress? And like, talk about falling on the heels of like coming out of a show, talking about nostalgia. It's like nostalgia is used to kind of reflect our progress. So if you think about a very popular practice where they will demolish the back end of a billing, building, but keep the sort of the decor facade and then build a new building in the background. And that is purely to kind of tap into nostalgia, but also for people to know how far we've come architecturally or in, in living and stuff like that. And so um, when the Nanaimo Art Gallery asked me to do the show, What is Progress? I immediately went into thinking about nostalgic objects. And my family immigrated to Nanaimo from um, from Ontario in Canada uh, in 1984, and we moved from a relatively urban uh, place in Ontario to a more rural kind of no, not rural, but small small city, very small city kind of thing. And it's in a community that uh, is a primary resource extraction community. So there's a lot of lumber, there's a pulp and paper mill there. And so trucks were the thing. And in a lot of ways, like small town Canada, trucks are still the thing. And the F-150 is like the number one selling truck in Canada for like ever in a day. <laughs> At least that's what they say. So I don't know if it's true or not, but... <laughs> We'll just go with it. And I think I I wanted to recreate like an F-150 for, to acknowledge sort of the community that I came from and the sort of the care and the watercolor aspect of it is I didn't want to kind of come off as someone that was judgmental about that community. I wanted to celebrate and honor that community as well. Like, I think it's really quite easy for people to be like, oh, you made a giant F-150 as you know, I didn't want to come off as like, I'm like judging or dismissive. I wanted to. And so the best way a crass person knows how to honor something is to like double down on technique and tradition. <laughs> so, you know, there I was, uh, you know, looking through old advertisements with these trucks and using those as source materials for of how I was going to paint this truck. And uh, yeah, building a large version of it. So on one hand, I was kind of honoring the community. And then on the other hand, you know, especially thinking about this as a, a way of communicating to my ancestors, you kind of want to send them the best gift you can send them, the best gift you can afford. And so this one was uh, one that I, I thought would fit that bill. And in this show, you actively engage the viewer with burning like the concept of burning some of the other pieces in the show have been burnt in the way they're painted like they look like they've been burnt with the f-150 it's lit from below so that it looks like it is about to be burnt or is like starting to burn mm -hmm. can you talk about how conceptually for you how does showing the burning communicate differently to the viewer because i feel like not a lot of canadians are going to know the joss paper tradition I think it's it's interesting because I think there is, yeah, that, that is a really interesting part. So with the burning, so I burnt some of the, the smaller paper objects that I was doing and I kind of stopped them halfway. And that is to illustrate or kind of 
play with those ideas about that sort of truncated conversation that I'm having with my ancestors or that really challenged conversation, even <laughs> immediately thinking about those times as a child where my parents would be calling their parents down in Trinidad and my brothers and I would just be hiding because it would just be like, we knew that we'd be like, Brendan, come over here, talk to your grandmother. And you'd like be like, hello. <laughs> and they'd be like, well, you know, and it would just be like this really awkward conversation. Um, so, uh, you know, there, I think that's kind of where I'm coming from, but I do feel like a Western audience will see these as objects that are in decay or disrepair or uh, have are being removed from history. And I think there's something that's interesting about that too, because that almost mirrors my relationship with these objects as well. The more I embrace these objects, the more I embrace a trucker hats or Labatt's 50, which is a beer up here, uh, the more I embrace this culture and community, the more I disappear as a Chinese South Asian individual <laughs> with Trinidadian and Irish heritage, <laughs> which is so <laughs> ridiculous. You know, it's like, so it's like this active disappearance and, and reveal that's kind of going on. There's a video piece that I've got in the show as well, where I've got one of the maquettes that I made. I made like three maquettes leading up to the full size truck and one of the maquettes I burnt all the way down. And I video recorded it as um, so the video plays forward and you see the truck burn down and then it unburns and the piece is called return to sender. So it's kind of playing again on this like, my embarrassment around burning these objects and then it arriving in the afterlife and then be like, what is this <laughs> next? I want a BMW. <laughs> it's like, this is not what I want. So they resend it, but also watching the video in reverse, it's like the truck is healing itself through flames. And that is just, it's really mesmerizing to watch like smoke go into an object and flames go into an object and it healing itself. And so there, I think with the show, there's a lot of sort of nuance and dualities that are kind of being played at a lot. One of the things I noticed with reluctant offerings is that often the uh, the objects have a sense of masculinity because it's like it's a trucker hat, beer bottles, the truck itself, some decorations that would be on the truck that are that are uh, very eighties masculine Canadian. So how do you think about that? Like, do you think about absorbing that sense of masculinity when you were a kid? Because that was a tie that binds all of this set of objects together. Yeah. And I do. And it, that's, you know, it's funny, like you, you, I think a lot of my objects and a lot of the work that I do is rooted in masculinity, even with the Ready Player Two. I remember one of the opening nights was on International Women's Day. And in the gallery, it was a group. Sh there was a number. There was another the show and it was like all men. And I was just like, oof. And then I started <laughs> thinking about Ready Player Two even more. And I was just like, this is really coming from a very macho kind of very boy space. And when I was thinking about this one with the Ford truck, like at, at its beginning, actually, I had originally thought about, about masculinity and, and, and exploring toxic masculinity. And I think this was, so this project really started two years ago and we were coming off of, you know, or not coming off of, but the real, uh, the movement, the Me Too movement had gained a lot of momentum. There was actual action opposed to people just retweeting or re-Instagramming stuff. And um, people were starting to get called out. Uh, there was real call for action to happen within all levels of uh, public life and, and private life. And I was interested in kind of interrogating that even more. So much so that the in the show, there is that separate room that has the burnt objects in the video. And originally I was thinking of that as the quote unquote man museum, where I would kind of really explore these ideas about how the the images and messages we get as young men as boys and and the continued messaging we get as older men so that that was its kind of original impetus and again i was you know i didn't i was mindful of how finger waggy that can kind of come off which didn't totally dissuade me but it did make me really kind of push the ideas even further as the work developed 
we had the year that we had, the COVID year, but more importantly, we had the real movement. Um, I remember there was the small maquette blue truck. I was working on that one. And that was the same time that uh, George Floyd was murdered. And so that really shook me to my core again. And then those questions around uh, the Black Lives Matter movement were, were coming to head. There was um, the Asian hate that was going on across both our countries. Um, that was That's still unacceptable. And I started really thinking about my myself and my own ethnic history and my, my place within a white community. And, um, and I think there was, I think I was really quite moved by that and quite moved by like the, the acknowledgement of white supremacy, not as just something relegated to neo-Nazis and KKK members, but as a systemic problem in, uh, in the world and in our communities. Um, And I also started thinking about how I'm embodying those things and how I, as a brown person sort of learned to survive by embodying these racist ideas and performing them and living with them. And so I think they're those objects that are very masculine, uh, those objects that are, you know, from a very specific white male community also, you know, I think those are, those intentional. Yeah. So, and it is also a way of me interrogating myself and it's like, yeah, sending my grandparents or my great, great grandparents, half burnt truck nuts is a real, you know, I don't know what they're going to do with it, but they've got it on the other side. (laughs) There's something interesting about how different generations play with objects uh, that are deemed masculine or not masculine. So I'm thinking about clothing around where I'm from in Virginia is like, like people, all the men wear car hearts because they often are like construction style jobs. So you need like durable pants. You mean they're not all potters? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, th- there's a huge potter overlap with Garhart pants for sure. <laughs> but then when I moved out to the West Coast to California, when my wife was in school, the skater kids, a generation younger, were wearing Carhart. So there was no, if there was any connection to this idea of like uh, construction or like Southern masculinity, it was, it was like tongue in cheek. Like they were wearing Carhartts because they were cool. And they became like almost like a lifestyle brand. And that's just like one style of clothing. But I think (laughs) often this happens in generations, like symbols mean something to parents. And then the kids are like, eh, I like that, but I'm changing what that means. I'm a pro I am, I'm going to shift uh, the power of these objects and re sort of class them in a different way, which I, I think it's great that we do that. Like we have the power as individuals to not take on the baggage of our parents, but to take on, kind of the aesthetics that we want and repurpose them mm-hmm. or add our own baggage to them. <laughs> that too. <laughs> and so the, the telephone game continues, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I love that. I remember going to grad school and I went to grad school at um, Southern Illinois university in Edwardsville and we'd be in a cafe for brunch or breakfast or whatever and you know people would walk in and you'd be like you'd kind of like just cover their head and you'd be like new york hipster or midwest <laughs> farmer and it's like it was almost undiscernible and it was uh it was pretty good but yeah like i think that i think that those exercises in semiotics is like something that is really important in my work and you can kind of see it in a lot not only with the work the just paper works and the reluctant offering works that i've done now but even with like with my the older my ceramic works my practice there uh for sure it's always playing with mess it's always playing with those images and deconstructing them and kind of retooling them well yeah let's let's shift into the ceramic work i think many people will know the body of work the manga ormalu mm-hmm. can you describe first what ormalu is like what that that practice was in europe yeah, so the Ormolu practice it dates back to like 18th century, probably even earlier, 15th, or you know, way back <laughs> in Europe. And what they would be doing is that they would be doing, um, they would have objects, and they did it to not only ceramics, they did it to furniture and jewelry, and that, or not jewelry, but like clocks and stuff like that. But they would put all this sort of gold filigree on it, and it would be lead or bronze bases, and then they would gold leaf it or put gold gilding on it. And it was a way of sort of really zhuzhing it up, like really kind of taking it 
a little bit too far. And so <laughs> with uh, with the ceramic stuff, they would bring in like Song Dynasty pots. They would bring in Chinese Ming Dynasty, uh, Qing and uh, Yuan Dynasty works. And they would put all this gold filigree on it. I've even seen ones where they've brought in like Chinese Buddha, like porcelain Buddhas. And then they've just put all this gold filigree on it and just bling the bejesus out of it. <laughs> and it's just so gaudy, but also really kind of amazing. Uh, and they were intended just to be like uh, curiosity objects. And it was, you know, making it more relevant to Western tastes by just being like, they couldn't just look at the sort of a quiet celadon pot and just kind of respect and honor it in its simplicity or its quietness or its subtlety. And they had to just kind of have a cherub vomit all over it and just put <laughs> like gold leaves. So I was, I was really excited by, you know, like by that sort of practice where it felt like it mirrored like my own existence where, you know, I wasn't raised particularly with a very strong Chinese upbringing or a very strong Indian upbringing, but it was always, my parents saw the value in that and also were excited by it. So we had like the knickknacks and the, and whatnot, like the Chinese, you know, room dividers or, or whatever, South Asian tap, you know, textiles and stuff like that. But it was always at a bit of a distance. It wasn't a, like an immersive kind of thing. And so the same thing with the Ormolu, it's like, I saw that and I was just like, that feels like my experience where it's just like, I know these things from abroad, but I also know like this very Western way of living. And so I immediately kind of appropriated <laughs> that way of working. Yeah, and in in your work, it, it becomes robot. The Ormolu aspect becomes robotic parts or sci-fi oriented. I, I saw you. Did you call it space future? What what do you call the mechanical parts? Yeah, it's just like science fiction or uh, like sci-fi. I think it also kind of plays into you know those those ideas around like Afro Afrofuturism, where people in marginalized communities will look to a kind of placing themselves in a f- sort of far future as a way of kind of thinking about where they're from. And, you know, like, I think when I immigrated to Canada, I was, I was a legal alien. And so, and that's how I was referred to. So it's, you know, it doesn't, it isn't a large stretch to kind of then just be like, oh, I kind of like that idea where I don't, I'm not reflected in the mass culture, but I feel like I could be reflected in like, as an alien. <laughs> well, I like that when you're putting these mechanical parts that reference the future onto often vase forms or historical ceramic forms that come from China, thinking about the way you match like pattern, like you'll have a, a mechanical part that's on the bottom of something and then a blue and white pattern will kind of grow around the pot around that. So it also makes me think about like where does one aesthetic stop and one begin, you know? Yeah. So when you think of the work, do you think of these objects as being Canadian objects or do you think of these as being like, how do you, how do you determine in your mind what the aesthetic is? Yeah, I would, I don't think I think them of as Canadian objects. They're just kind of like human objects in a lot of ways. Like they kind of, I almost think of them in the same way that, you know, we think of New York or Paris or Shanghai, like these are cities that belong to the world. They're not like a country's work, you know, city. So I should probably mention Toronto because we are talking <laughs> Canadian here. So, <laughs> so, but it's like, in terms of the aesthetics, like I, you know, I get really like old school and I start thinking about, um, sometimes I let the, the forms decide what, how they kind of how the composition will be formed. But I also think a lot about, um, I get really inspired by things that happen in nature and how like barnacle grows or how fungus grows on trees or like those other symbiotic relationships or invasive relationships. And so I kind of look to that to inform the compositions that I create with the ceramics. And I think about, and it's almost like, you know, like a soundboard for like a mixing board for music. It's like, I'll turn up the robotic part and turn down the blue and white part or vice versa. And then 
thinking about how I paint the surface, which is kind of the beautiful thing about ceramics. We get to think about form and surface. Um, and so sometimes where a form will be really dense, I will put a very quiet surface on it and vice versa and just kind of play with those things. It, it does become very much like a formal exercise. Like it like almost sort of depart from the sort of conceptual ideas or the underpinnings of the work and just kind of think about uh, you know, volume and negative space and, and all of those sort of foundation art school kind of training things. And it seems like a body of work that you've been able to continue for a long amount of time while working on other things, yeah. you know? So we, we talked about Ready Player Two and, and Reluctant Offerings, but there's also, I was looking on your website, there's also this body of work where you were doing printing on the skin yeah. by tying tiles to the body is a way of self-decoration, which I want to come back to in a second. But it seems like that 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 body of work, the Mango Ormlu series, just continues on. You know, like it's always kind of you're always working on those things. Is that the way you approach that? Yeah, it's really it's it's kind of been a treat with the Mango Ormlu work. It's like it has it has changed over the years and like different iterations. And it's you know there's. It's such a funny thing because it's like, on one part, I am so grateful that people are really interested in this body of work. And I'm really happy. And and I'm also really grateful that I, I still enjoy making the work. You know, I think there's a lot of us in the creative industry where you just kind of get known for a thing and you just kind of have to rinse and repeat because you need to pay the bills and sort of have food in your belly. So, you know, I think that is... Um, that is something that I'm very grateful for and able to sort of keep on pushing and, and, and changing. And then I always get to points where I'm just like revisit the idea and alter them. Like, so, you know, at their beginning, they were just the robotic elements on the vase. And then later on the robotic elements started sort of pinching and pulling and squeezing the vase. And it started reacting as though it's like, you know, a large man wearing a tight belt kind of thing. And so, and then later on, it was like the skin peeling back where the the blue and white was almost like uh, sort of peeling itself off of, like shedding a skin. And then more recently, I started doing ones where the, 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 the vase has completely lost its bone structure and it's becoming like this more liquid kind of element. And it's starting to become more almost like akin to like lava lamps where it's like this or amorphous thing. And, and I think those are, those are things in terms of how I'm evolving with the idea. And then I've done iterations where, yeah, like I, it's, it there, I feel like there's a lot of fruitful things to be played with in terms of where I'm sort of feeling I also feel like it's really funny kind of like, cause I've been working on the series like almost 15 years, like probably more. Cause like I started even before grad school. So that would have been in like 2002 and I was working on the series uh, then. And then during grad school, it was on pause. And then after grad school, I started ramping it back up again and started changing it. And all I think a lot of the experiences I had in grad school influenced the way I worked. And so now it sort of changed how I want to approach the work. And um, yeah, and it, 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 you know, I teach it at the local art school at Emily Carr University. And it's really funny because, you know, we just have our students and this is art school in general. It's just like, you know, it's, you know, one thing, and then you have three weeks to finish it. Critique next, next thing, three weeks. And then and I'm just like, huh, I wonder like students are just like, but you get to work on yours for like a year. <laughs> it's like, you'll get there. As someone who's observed your career from the outside, I'm, I'm always pleased with the next iteration of that body of work. You know, like I'll see something and I'll be like, huh, that is a good idea. Like I keep <laughs> thinking that over and over again. <laughs> um, that's great. That's good. It's a true evolution. You know, like e each time you're coming back with a new set of uh, formal characteristics or, or like you said, sometimes it's conceptual, like peeling back the blue and white. Like what a great thing. That seems like a really rich uh, conceptual idea there. 
Yeah, it's been it's been really fun because it also changes like how you view it. Like, you know, when the robotic parts are pinching and pulling at the vase, it becomes like a very adversarial relationship. But then when the robotic parts are emerging from the vase, it becomes like one thing transitioning into another. It becomes more of a narrative around metamorphosis and and that sort of thing. And I definitely feel like those were coming out of my feelings around things like Facebook or YouTube or whatever. It's like those are stemming out of our desire to share and be social with one another and to connect with one another, you know, they're a totally different animal now, but it's like, you know, in its, in, in, so to MC, it's those were its original ideas. And so I think those have been some really exciting things about the work. And now, and now I'm starting to think about how our technologies are changing us. Like not only how we think and how we sort of approach, like I think on a cultural level, we all are suffering from ADHD because our phones and things are always sort of nattering at us in all different directions. And um, so like, I wanted to kind of play with that and like, play with how the vase is now just becoming like an abstraction. It's like our technology is making our identity an abstract idea, like how I present myself on Instagram or even with you right now with my partner, they're all, they're all versions of myself and they're all shifting and changing and morphing and, and all of that sort of stuff. So I'm I'm interested in those things as well. Well, I wanted to talk about the body of work where you were doing skin printing. Can you explain more about that? Yeah, so that was a body of work that was called Residue. Uh, What was it? Residue Exploring the Lore. No, I shouldn't know this. But but that was also a collaboration. And oh my God, like collaborations has been something that's becoming like such a, a strong part of my practice now. And I think because like art making for me, is always been kind of like a monastic kind of thing. It's always just me in the studio with podcasts now, but used to be the radio and all that sort of stuff. And it's, but it was, and it's funny because like, I know a lot of my peers will have like studio assistants and stuff like that. And I'm just like, I, I don't want to give the making away. Like, that's why I come into the studio. It's like, I love getting my hands dirty and wrestling with problems. And I will get in a studio assistant to answer emails, but I will not get a studio assistant to make my work because that's my joy. And so with collaborations though, I've been working with artists. So Sunny Asu is one example of that. And Dion Akiari is the other example with the Residue series. And her and I were asked by the Malaspina printmaker, uh, Printmakers Gallery to do a celebration of an anniversary of theirs. And they wanted us to explore printmaking, but also printmaking in the new age through digital 3D printing. And at the time I had a replicator two by like a MakerBot replicator two. And Dion and I's uh, work and research kind of intersect in multiple levels, but like one of the major levels is that we're both, we're both immigrants and we are both interested in the decorative arts. And hers is uh, out of, um, you know, citing batik patterns out of Indonesia and a lot of the imagery out of there. And mine is from uh, South Asian and Chinese heritage. And so making these tiles, uh, we basically made like 3D printed tiles with these images on them. And then we were thinking about how we print with them. And we were thinking about uh, using skin as the paper. And so we pressed these images into the bodies and then held them for there for like 15 minutes. And then when you release it, you have that sort of imprint, kind of like when you wake up with a pillow mark on your face. And so we really loved that idea. And then we started, we were, we were like, in the same way, we were thinking, okay, well, what kind of, you know, quote unquote paper do we want to use? And we immediately were just like, well, we should be using immigrant bodies. And the ones that we had available to us was our own bodies and Dion's sister and my mother and father. And this was an interesting project because this was kind of the first the first time that I had invited my parents into the making process of it, but also like my parents are not artists. And so this was also a really interesting time for them 
to me to try and get over sort of that petulant teenager thing that I'm kind of stuck with with them where I'm just like, you don't understand me. <laughs> so now I was like, you're part of the process. This is what I'm doing. These are some tiles. Which ones do you find interesting? And uh, it was really beautiful to then take photographs of those. And so the work exists as documentation of these sort of uh, these sort of ephemeral moments of these imprinted images on their skin. And I think we were definitely thinking about how the culture is presumed on skin color. Like we, we kind of think about, you know, sometimes it's obvious, you know, what heritage somebody is coming from with their skin color, but it's not always obvious. And so we kind of wanted to play with those things as well. And so, yeah, kind of thinking about how our skin carries our, some of our histories, our family's histories in them. But what's so beautiful is the idea that they fade. Yeah. So what our family gives us as a cultural influence, we take it in, but sometimes we keep it, sometimes we don't. You know, and and in your case, where your family immigrated to one, you kind of have a triangular Im- immigration, immigrated to Trinidad, then immigrated to Ireland. I guess it's a quad, and then <laughs> and then to Canada. You know, there's there's this sense of uh, taking your culture with you, but also sometimes it's natural to let our cultures go. So there was something really beautiful about that as the imprint of the skin fades and the pattern starts to go away, then we just go back to us. And that that's how I always feel like the individual experience of culture is, is like, we're just us, you know, mm-hmm. like we, it's hard to know where our influences really come from until we sit down and try to figure them out. We really are just living beings, living in the moment, enjoying our lives as best we can. Mm -hmm. And to kind of continue that metaphor, like I've also been kind of exploring ideas around epigenetics, where it's the idea that, you know, we have our genetic pattern that is given to us from our parents, parents, you know, grandparents, etc. But we also that DNA is altered uh, by situations that happen in previous generations. So if somebody, you know, for instance, this is a is a simple oversimplification, but like if they have some sort of trauma in and around fire, that is almost like imprinted in your DNA. And it's, it's, it's gone on in further forward and kind of thinking about generational trauma as being, you know, something that is a really important thing. And, and also a way of understanding yourself, like the generational trauma that we all carry and, you know, where our bias is, where we think we might arrive at a problem or a solution, a certain way, you'd just be like, oh, that is something that might have been imprinted from our grandmothers, our grandfathers, our great grandmothers. And, um, you know, it was interesting after, so when I was doing that project, I was, I would be 3D printing these objects and then to test them, I would press them on my forearm. Well, a month after that project had done finished, there was like discoloration on my forearm. And I was just like, this is an interesting, you know, it, I couldn't read what was on my arm because it was just a mishmash of the same different uh, tiles printed on my skin. But it was just like, I thought that was kind of also another interesting metaphor for generational trauma. It's like you have this muddied sense of or a way of reacting and you're just not sure why you're reacting that way because you might not know your family history or what your, or your family history has been denied to you. Like the indigenous population of Canada. It's like, I think there's been so much tamping of the history there and a lot of marginalized communities, their histories have been erased as a way of um, managing that community. Can I ask you about therapy? Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because one of the things about generational trauma that I think is particularly tricky is that if a trauma happens to you, you can go to a therapist and talk to them about it. But if a trauma happened to your grandparents and your grandparents treated your parents a certain way and then your parents treat you a certain way, how are you going to know what to talk to the therapist about? (laughs) (laughs) So can you talk about like utilizing therapy or other methods of healing as a way to understand yourself? Yeah, I think, oh man, that is a work in progress. <laughs> boy, oh boy. And it's it's funny you should ask me about this because, it's, you know, I actually started seeing another therapist and it's just kind of like, because, you know, the older I get, like, I feel like so much of my 30s was um, 
and kind of identifying my problems and then placing blame <laughs> usually on my parents, but you know, you, it's like placing blame in certain spots. And then like now my forties, I feel is like, okay, you have identified the problems. You said these are, these are your, the sources or whatever. Now you actually have to do the work and deal with it. It's like one thing to sort of acknowledge it. And the more I feel about it, it's like, it, it feels like going to the gym. It's not, you can't just do a curl, do, you know, bicep curls and just be like, okay, I did, I did my 10 reps. I never have to do that ever again in my life. It's like a constant unpacking and un- unveiling of it. And, you know, like I was talking to my therapist and we were, talking about some things that I would like to get rid of. And they were just like, you know what? You're probably not going to get rid of those feelings. <laughs> they might just recede in the background, but you just need to learn to live with them. That is who you are. And so I feel like maybe, and for any of the listeners, don't take that as the therapist to actually go see somebody. It's amazing to talk to people and work these things out. But, um, you know, I think that's something that's interesting. It's like, yeah, it's I think, yeah, you, it's not that you're going to get rid of or deal or unpack or completely resolve the things that you are given from your history, but it's also to acknowledge them and to respect them. And also to be like, yeah, I, you serve a purpose. Like, I think as artists and creators, we all have, and maybe this is also part of, it only gets amplified in art school, but we get this inner critic. That is really great. It can be such a guiding light in our studios when we, we just don't know where we're going. And you hear that voice is like, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. You maybe should add more red or deal this up or scale this up. But there are times where my inner critic, I just need to put a pillow over its face and just be <laughs> like, just be quiet. I need to work. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's learning to live with that, live with that entity in your head and just be like, you know, okay, you, you do serve a purpose. I acknowledge that. I'm grateful that you're here, but I also need to acknowledge my voice and where I want to go with this in my life and what I want to do at this point in time. And it's so much about balance, you know, like, like I, I too have grown a lot from the idea of the inner critic, but I, I need like 6.5% inner critic. <laughs> and if it gets to like even 10%, I can get debilitated and just not do anything and not make art, not, you know, become angry with my wife. Like there's all these like ramifications of spending too much time in my head. But I think it's a good point that you bring up that it can be a positive guiding force if taken with a grain of salt, so to speak. Yeah. And, you know, these things all develop for, you know, they're all sort of defense mechanisms. They're these voices, you know, are in your head because they're trying to save your butt because of the histories that you've had or your family's had or whoever. And so, um, yeah, there is there is interesting there. I've also been looking into and done a little bit of work into cognitive behavioral therapy, which is also a really interesting uh, thing as well as a way, especially as an artist and a creative. I think sometimes I can get really emotional and think that is who I am. Uh, and I think with cognitive behavioral therapy, it's like more like about managing those feelings and also externalizing them and saying, you know, you are not this sort of <laughs> sort of person in your studio who can't make anything because you know you're avoiding working in the studio and you're just on Facebook it's you know you are not that person you're you know it's like all those sort of things so I you know I think those are if you can if you can get access to those things I think it's really amazing um, but yeah I am really fortunate that I do have access to those things. Uh, and I would suggest it to anybody if they can get it through their benefits at work, or even if, you know, I've been, I've been an artist working, um, as a career artist for all of my life so far, all of my adult life. And only as of recently, will I be get like, I just landed a full-time gig. So, you know, that, that'll maybe change some things, but, you know, I was doing, I was paying that on my own, you know, I think it's important. It's like a gym membership or going to see the dentist. <laughs> I have never regretted it also. Like every time I, I, I tend to go to a therapist for like a chunk of time and then take some time off and go back for a chunk of time. And I never leave going, ah, I wish I hadn't have spent that six months. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always like, oh, this was, this was worth it. This was really good. <laughs> yeah. But I tell you that the anxiety leading up to that moment, 
<laughs> I'm just like, I'm like talking myself out of it constantly. And then I get there and I'm just like, that was totally worth it. And it's the same with the gym, you know, or yoga classes. It's just like, I don't have time to do a yoga series or do, a, you know, lift some weights. And then afterward, I'm just like blissed out. I'm just like, <laughs> that was the best. <laughs> To wrap up, can you plug your website and social media? And then also Emily Carr. We, we didn't talk that much about that, but I want people to you know, know about that program and find information about it. So my website is brendantang.com. Uh, and then you can also find me on Instagram, which I'm relatively active on, um, which is uh, Brendan Tang. You can just look that one. I don't know how I scored that, but I did. And then if you are want to get onto the nerdy side of me, you can look me up on Instagram called Brendan Gets a Hobby, which is like all my board game stuff. We, we were talking nice. about this after, before we got on the mic, but yeah. <laughs> And then Emily Carr, I work at Emily Carr University, uh, uh, which is in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And it is a four-year undergrad program, a two-year master's program. We have um, the building itself is, I think, what are we, three years old now? And we've got more blouse that you can shake a stick at. <laughs> <laughs> and a really great department. Uh, I teach with Julie York. Uh, Jen Wooden is currently there. We have an amazing group of technicians in the ceramic department. But we also have, you know, we have a really great school in general. Like the painting is really strong. Photography, everything is really great. We also have industrial design, which is amazing because we've got this partnership with industrial design, which is a whole other degree within ceramics. So you'll take a ceramic class and half your class will be fine art students and half of them will be industrial designers. And I tell you what, it is like so different how each community approaches it. Like the industrial designers, they go through sketchbooks like I have never <laughs> seen in my entire life. Their drawings are just so beautiful. And it's like that they they have this discipline and then the, the fine art students. Anyhow, we could that could be a whole other conversation. It's a really great school and I am so pumped that I am there uh, now. And it just it delights me to know that if somebody comes to Emily Carr that, and works in ceramics, there's a good chance that I'll be working with them. That's just cool. Well, thanks, man. It was good to see you. And uh, thanks for doing this. Likewise, we should do this in person sometime. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ben. A big thank you goes out to Brendan for taking the time to do this interview. It was a pleasure to connect and chat about what he has going on in the studio. Before we go, I wanted to give a plug for the Canadian Clay Directory that is supported by Make and Do and is completely free to any artist that's working in Canada. So I encourage you to do that at makeanddo.ca. Also wanted to take a minute and thank Carol Epp. She helped me to organize this year's Canada Week interviews, and she is an absolute force of nature, both in the studio and in the community building. The Canadian landscape would not be the same without her, and I've got to say, myself as an artist and interviewer, I would not be the same without the input of folks like her. So big thanks to Carol. I'm going to take next week off and let you guys digest all of these new interviews. Thanks as always for tuning in, and I'll see you in just a few weeks. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. <laughs>